Inside Outside Innovation is the podcast that brings you the best and the brightest in the world of startups and innovation. I'm your host, Brian Ardinger, founder of InsideOutside.io, a provider of research, events, and consulting services that help innovators and entrepreneurs build better products, launch new ideas, and compete in a world of change and disruption. Each week, we'll give you a front row seat to the latest thinking, tools, tactics, and trends in collaborative innovation. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of Inside Outside Innovation. Here we are at the back end of Innovation Conference this week in Phoenix, Arizona. I am lucky enough to have another amazing guest on our show, Melissa Steech. Melissa is with Herman Miller, and she is a ergonomic specialist, designer, all-around interesting person. I had a chance to listen to her talk yesterday, and super excited to have her on the show. Welcome, Melissa. Hi, thanks for having me, Brian. Melissa, I wanted to have you on the show because you kind of bring a different perspective to innovation. From the design perspective and from looking at environments and how do environments kind of influence creative thinking and innovation. So I wanted to kind of start at that part of, the, of your journey in that. So Melissa, tell me a little bit about your early journey and how did you get involved in design and then eventually into innovation? Well, I'll date myself a little bit here, but when I started in art school, you were either an artist or not, essentially. <laughs> and when I would talk, as even way back in high school, when I would talk about I wanted to combine more scientific world, I guess, for lack of a, a better word, and an artistic world, people would tell me, well, choose a lane. And I was always very entrepreneurial. I used to make hair ribbons at seven and sell them door to door in little sandwich bags. And I was always monetizing. I would draw superheroes for a quarter. If you wanted a car that matched the superhero, that was 50 cents. Like I always had ice cream money. I was always being pushed to make a decision one way or another. So fast forward to about five years ago, I just threw my hands up and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to make a way for myself, having no idea that this industry really existed. So with my art degree and with my long list of different sorts of jobs of trying to find myself, I went and I applied to graduate school and I said to them, I really believe in the built environment and I think IO psychology ties into this because of human factors and I have a background as an artist and this is what I believe and I know. And they were like, yeah, if you can pass stats, maybe. (laughs) And so that's what's led me to today. And it's been so amazing because then, you know, it's always been there, but this veil has been removed and I'm like, oh, there's this whole industry. There are titles for this, you know, see, there's my tribe. So that's how it's come about. So you've been with uh, Herman Miller, I think, for three years or so. Tell me a little bit about the ergonomic specialists uh, actually do at Herman Miller, and, and how does that play out in everyday work sense? It's interesting, our roles, because we're all throughout the United States and Canada, and we all have our baseline responsibility, which is we do a lot of educating, be it to potential client clients, the architecture and design community, where we talk about the importance of ergonomics in the workplace. And with this whole new movement and interest in well-being and wellness, people are, they're actually eager to learn about it. They ask us to come in. So there's that baseline. And sometimes we do assessments, you know, after the client, um, after we're done with the project, we'll go back in and we'll work one-on-one or do big trainings. But then what's really cool is that all of us have different specialties, I would say. So one of my colleagues is a physical therapist. She's a doctor of physical therapy. So she can get super nerdy on the human body and the mechanics of the human body. And it's really incredible, honestly. Another one of my colleagues based in Texas is this lean Six Sigma black belt. Her degree is in biology and environmentalism. And so she starts talking about all kinds of stuff. And then some of us um, have MBAs. There's another IO psychologist who's a really dear friend of mine in Atlanta. So I just say all that to say that we're really, we're a motley crew of nerds who also really value the importance of the human, which we tend to get away from, I think. In the innovation space, we talk a lot about kind of the the metrics and the different ways you can bring new ideas to life, so to speak. How important is the environment and the place where people 
live and work. How much of a factor do you believe that is in having an innovative mind or a creative mind or being able to actually execute on your new ideas? I think it's everything. Now, do I think that the environment can set the destiny of your life? No. But it can either really help or hinder you, depending. And it's really interesting because some of the most exciting research is coming out of healthcare because everything is changing. We're living so much longer. We're working so much longer. Uh, Since the recession, Americans are really returning back to multiple generations within the home, which we've not been that way for a long time, right? Having lived abroad, that's something that other countries, they still do. And so there's much more of an emphasis on health and how the built environment can facilitate the well-being of someone who's not only growing, so the cognitive aspects of child development, then the relationship aspects of making sure, whether it's the family at home or the family at work, that they're healthy. And then also just keeping, if people don't feel well, how do you help ameliorate some of those you know, feelings? So a lot of our uh, audience are either folks within big corporations that are trying to spin up new innovation labs and they think they need to put a ping pong table in to make them innovative or, or startup founders that are trying to get off the ground. What are some kind of best practices that you've seen to kind of create those early stage creative environments that are actually impactful and not just window covering? <laughs> I'm laughing because I feel like everything I, I say is so obvious, but ask your people first. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a cool environment Nobody's using that damn ping pong table. Nobody cares, you know. But, oh, we're cool, we're innovative, we're edgy because we have a ping pong table. Or we have a ton of junk food. You know, it's like, so do you want five-year-olds to work for you and crash? Because that's what you're going to have. You're going to have meltdowns on your hands. And I really, really think that, and I believe this is changing now because it's moved past a trend and become more of a staple of this is part of what you do to make a productive workspace. But ask your people. Of course, depending if you're from a very large organization, it could be overwhelming to have it be completely democratic, but you have your electorate college, essentially, you know, and then they go out and they ask, and then you you pull that together. Because a lot of people may say, hey, I, I don't want a ping pong table, but can we get meditation rooms or whatever? So environment is playing a big role also in in the attraction of uh, of workforce and this whole talent and the need to be more adaptable. And you mentioned that a little bit in your talk, how companies are are looking at their space as a primary driver for attracting talent. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And I might get this statistic wrong, but I think about a third of a company's cost is on real estate. That's huge. And then almost an equal part of that is your human capital, right? So those are two of your biggest costs. And they really need to they really need to dance well together. And so that's what we're finding is that when you slow down and you really look at I, I'm gonna say who your company is, because it really is its own being in, in many ways. Look at that, really spend time with understanding it, then develop a built environment that really, really reflects that so that it helps there's a thing in IO called PO fit. So it's person, person, organization fit. And what it basically says is that if one or the other is pretty, they're not aligned, it will self-select. But unfortunately for organizations, that's great for people, but for organizations, turnover is really, really expensive, and it takes a long time to recoup those costs. So the more cohesive your organization is in terms of its stated values and mission and purpose, and that is visible, right, then the more likely people are to know that immediately and know whether or not they're a good fit. And it saves you a lot of the time and the training and all the costs that are associated with that. So that's really, really important. And then beyond that, once people are there, taking care of them because people don't perform well when they don't feel well. I was telling someone the other day, they were talking about how good our chairs are. And I said, yeah, you know, it's funny because furniture has become such a commoditized industry, and I think all of us are feeling that in various industries, like the commodity effect, and how do you differentiate from there? And I said, you know, of all the things we do, and I think we do everything well, chairs, like, you just can't, you just can't beat our chairs. And I say this all the time, but in my own little work office, I had this because it's at home and I want it to look cute. I have this little, I have this acrylic Ghost Louis chair, you know, that's completely see-through in the little armchair. Looks great. 
So for weeks, I've been working on a project, and I have been hating life, like totally hating life. And I was like, you know what, screw this. I push the chair aside, I bring in an air on, and I sit, and all of a sudden, I love my project. And it didn't dawn on me immediately, but then a couple days later, I was like, wait, what's changed here? Literally, it was the chair. And I think it's because my body felt so much better sitting. And that's where ergonomics, in a very real way that you can really quantify, plays a role in a company's bottom line. We see a lot of new research coming out about the open office concept, and everybody's moving to that, but yet there's seems to be new research coming out saying that's not the best way to work. What are you seeing uh, in the industry, and uh, what are some of the trends that you're seeing uh, with, when it comes to office space? I see that the pendulum is swinging back to the middle, like it always does. And that's why we put so much stock in placemaking. So what placemaking is, is that it's basically a personality chart for your organization. And what you find is that, hey, we're a lot more complex and interesting than we allow ourselves to be. So, for example, many companies have the three big ones, the conference room, the work desk, and then the private offices. And what people tend to find through the placemaking process is that most of those private offices are going unused because they belong to executives who, if they're doing their job well, are never there. A lot of those open desks, particularly now with so many companies having being sales or operations, if your people are doing their thing, they're not in the office, they're out in front of clients. And so then you have your admins who are holding down the fort and maybe the conference room that you don't need to be that big. You know what I mean? So they begin to see, oh, wow, we could really be optimizing the space. Maybe we don't need as much real estate as we thought we did. Or maybe we want to keep all this real estate, but let's have a lot more fun with it and make this a place that when people are here working 12 hours a day, they really enjoy it. It feels like a cool hotel lobby or like a cooler version of your home that you don't have to clean up, you know, (laughs) and you can't really completely go to sleep in. You can maybe take a nap, but that's about it. The last topic I want to talk about is is Herman Miller itself. It's been so iconic for a lot of decades. How does an old company like Herman Miller kind of stay relevant and stay innovative in a changing world? What I love so much about human, Herman Miller, and, and I said human, right, Herman Miller, is that we really are a human-centered research design company. It really does start with a human. And, you know, even back in our history, we made the first splint with the curved wood. And the Eames chair, the wood chair, we figured out how to curve that wood so that it would have rather than hard edges. It would have soft, round edges like the body. And so with a colleague, we just did a workshop at Gensler where we talked about the ergonomics of the Eames Lounge because it's beautiful and everyone loves it. Well, and part of why people love it, because how many beautiful things out there are there that they don't really stand the test of time and they aren't as coveted? And I believe that We've stood the test of time, and we continue to stay innovative because we never lose sight of how important the person is to everything that we do. And that's what hasn't changed over the years is people, you know, our drivers, our motives, our needs. The tools that we need to support us have evolved. Well, Lissa, thank you very much for being on the show. If people want to find out more about yourself or Herman Miller, what's the best way to do that? They can either find me on LinkedIn at Melissa Steech or feel free to email me directly at Melissa underscore Steech at HermanMiller.com. Excellent. Thanks very much for being on the show. Thank you. That's it for another episode of Inside Outside Innovation. If you want to learn more about our team, our content, our services, check out InsideOutside.io or follow us on Twitter at the IO Podcast or at Artinger. Until next time, go out and innovate.